Sometimes you have to stand even when other people say sit down. Mm. You have to speak even when others say be quiet. I was taught that by extraordinary people like Rosa Parks. And I, I think all of you have felt that, you understand that. I have no doubt that Rosa Parks would be proud. And she would say to all of you, you know, be brave, be brave, be brave, because it's what we have to do to make a difference. Brian Stevenson is one of those characters that you get very few chances to meet in your life. He's done such amazing work. He continues to do such amazing work. His story really tells you a lot about how someone with a mission and a vision can impact the world. As you guys know, BookTube is a vibrant community of people who go to YouTube to discuss their love of learning and love of literature. And today we have author Brian Stevenson here with us to discuss his book and the recent film, Just Mercy. So Brian, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, it's great to be with you. So we're really excited to get started. We have so many questions, both about the movie <laughs> and about the book. Okay. And I wanted you to just get started by telling us a little bit about the work that you do on behalf of incarcerated people. Sure, so I run a nonprofit organization called the Equal Justice Initiative. We provide legal services to people who are poor, to people who are incarcerated. And for about 35 years now, I've been engaged in helping people who've been wrongly convicted and unfairly sentenced, and also trying to push the country to deal more honestly with our history of inequality. I want to get this number right, because it's an impressive number. The Equal Justice Initiative has exonerated 166. We've actually done 135 people who were wrongly convicted on death row. Yes. The total number of exonerations are 166 nationwide. Wow. It's very exciting, you know, I'll walk down the hallway of my office and I'll see two people I initially met in a prison who had been told they were going to die in prison. And they are now people on my staff. So Anthony Ray Hinton, who I mm -hmm. talk about, spent 30 years on death row for a crime he didn't commit, now works at EJI. And Ian Manuel, he's a spoken word artist. Mm -hmm. And they'll be down at the hallway and they'll be laughing. And it's the beautiful part about my work is that we can sometimes see redemption on display in the lives of people who have finally won their freedom. The book and the film center largely around one of your clients, Walter McMillan. Mm -hmm. It is ordered, adjudged, and decreed that Walter McMillan is to face death by electrocution. Could you talk about why you chose his story specifically? I liked Walter's story because we haven't told stories about people like Walter McMillan honestly. And I was struck with the irony that Walter McMillan was accused of a crime that took place in Monroeville, Alabama, which of course is the community where Harper Lee grew up and wrote To Kill a Mockingbird. When I started working on this case and I went to Monroeville, it's a community that was preoccupied with that story. All the streets are named after characters in the movie. They have a play they put on. They love that story. They love the celebrity that their town has as a result of its uh, relationship with Harper Lee. And when I started working on the case, everybody would say, oh, if you're a lawyer, you should go over to the To Kill a Mockingbird Museum. Gregory Peck came here and we have gold feet in the courtroom. You can stand where he stood. And I'd be saying things like, well, I'm actually representing this innocent black man on death row. I don't really have time to go to the To Kill a Mockingbird Museum. But that disconnect was, I think, important for me to explore as I wrote about this, because Mr. McMillan was so terribly, it was so clear he was innocent, right? Uh, the crime takes place downtown Monroeville. At the time of the crime, he's with about 30 other black people at his house, raising money for his sister's church. Despite that, they arrest him. They put him on death row before the trial takes place. It's the only case I've ever worked on where the client spent 15 months on death row pre-trial and imposed a death sentence. For me, it was an important story to use as a platform to expose some of the challenges that we have. And it was really joyous when we were ultimately to get justice for him. So you have had the very rare experience of getting to see your book become a movie. <laughs> and on top of that, you have gotten the luxury of sharing space with Jamie Foxx, yeah. 
with Michael B. Jordan. I would just like to know about that experience for you. What has that been like? <laughs> it's been fun. I, I mean, uh, Michael's terrific, Jamie's terrific, Brie Larson is fantastic. All of these superheroes on the film, they're really committed uh, to making the film work. And this film, I'm also proud to say, was the first major film where the studio committed to an inclusion writer, which actually meant that there would be diversity in all roles, both in mm -hmm. front and behind the camera. Mm -hmm. And they would talk about how it was one of the most diverse sets they'd ever been on, which was also really exciting. But it's been great working with them, and it is exciting. Um, I mean, it's a little surreal to see, you know, like Michael B. Jordan playing me, which is kind of crazy. And uh, we spent some time together, and he was very good about asking what to do and all of that. And said, the one thing I don't want you to do is to lose your Creed Black Panther body when you play me. <laughs> I don't want you to go on a lawyer diet. I, I, you can keep, that could be the one inauthentic part of this film. <laughs> and, do everyone on just service. Uh, yes. like, you know, just for the sake of this exactly, nation. Exactly, that's right. That's exactly you right. maintain that. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, I'm Jesse from Bowties and Books. Reading was the first time in my entire life that I ever felt seen and understood. I've always felt like an outsider, no matter in what space I'm in. And BookTube is the first place where I've come in and felt like I belonged here. Brian and I are going to do a lightning round of questions. Try not to give too much thought into them. Okay. Okay. Favorite place to read? At home, in my living room, in a chair that has a nice little light. Favorite place to write? A little office that's next to my bedroom. Do you have a favorite dance move? Wow. It would be my last dance move, which would be the bump. That's the best I could do on that one. The bump? <laughs> okay. It was popular in, like, the 70s, maybe. I will be Googling this promptly. You should, you should. <laughs> There's a line that your character in the movie delivers. I know what it's like to be in the shadows. That's why I'm doing this. Could you talk about, like, personal experiences with that? Sure. Do you still feel this? I do. I mean, I think that, um, you know, despite the progress we've made, there is still a presumption of dangerousness and guilt that gets assigned to many people of color. I was born at the end of the Jim Crow era, and we'd see those signs that said white and colored. My parents were humiliated every day of their lives by this judgment that they weren't good enough to walk through the front door. They weren't good enough to sit in the front and it creates a sort of burden, that history. I certainly experienced that as a, as a child growing up. When integration came, I was a kid who was always raising his hand because I wanted, you know, to answer the questions. And there were times when it just seemed like I would never get called on. And while it, you know, it seems kind of trivial and minor, when you're young and you're, and you're looking to belong, it's a really painful thing to experience. And um, even now, when I'm practicing law and I've had this long career, it still happens. So I argued a case at the United States Supreme Court just a few years ago. And about two weeks later, I had another hearing in a trial court in the Midwest. And I went to this court, and I had my suit and tie on, and I sat down at defense counsel's table. I got there early. And when the judge walked in and he saw me sitting there, he got angry and he said, hey, 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 you get back out there in the hallway. You wait until your lawyer gets here. I don't want any defendants sitting in my courtroom without their lawyer. And I had to stand up and apologize. And I said to the judge, I said, oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Brian Stevens and I am the lawyer. And the judge started laughing and the prosecutor started laughing and I made myself laugh because I didn't want to disadvantage my client. What you just said just brought up so much yeah. for me, um, especially on what it's like to be marginalized mm -hmm. and to not have people accept yeah. all of the indignities that you suffer yeah. daily. And this is a very, very personal topic for me sure. because you know, the, a lot of the, the mental health issues that I've struggled, um, my mother actually fought really hard to find an African-American therapist to send me to and she was able to help me see that the level of anxiety that I feel on a day-to-day -day basis is because 
of how I'm perceived. Yeah. And like you talk about your experience with the judge and wearing a suit, it doesn't matter what you're wearing. Yeah, that's right. You know, we have this idea in marginalized communities, especially that wealth will insulate you and it will protect you, yeah. but it does not. That's right. Because that's not how perception works. If you have prejudice, it doesn't matter what the person is wearing. Absolutely. Prejudice is prejudice. That's right. And, and, and I'm so glad you said that, that you can be the most talented physician, you can be the most talented teacher, you can be a brilliant engineer or a scientist, but if you are black or brown, you're gonna go places where you're going to have to navigate a presumption of dangerousness and mm. guilt, a presumption that you're not valid. Mm. And I'm getting old enough now to acknowledge the fact that it's exhausting. And that's why for me it is so urgent that we do what we can to break down bigotry, to break down bias, to break down hatred. I mean, people have to be taught hmm. to hate other people because they're different. It seemed like in Walter's case that was definitely it, that they mm -hmm. had fixated on him, that yeah. the police, that the prosecutors were unwilling, even in the face of overwhelming evidence, to pivot their vision and to pivot what they thought about right. him. How, through all of those years of setbacks, of frustration, how did you maintain sort of your optimism or your ability to fight that case? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think um, it can be challenging, but for me, hope is sort of an orientation, it's a requirement. I actually think that hopelessness is the enemy of justice. Mm -hmm. I actually think injustice prevails where hopelessness persists. It's hard because you see so much inequality, but my clients actually make it easier. Walt McMillan's family embraced me, mm -hmm. they accepted me, they gave me what they could to do what I could to fight. You know, I was a young lawyer at the time. I started working on Walter McMillan's case and yet he trusted me, you know, with his life. And that has really influenced the way I practice. I'm constantly having to hope we can end mistreatment and abuse of our clients, even though we haven't seen precedent that suggests that's going to happen. We won these cases banning life without parole sentences for children. Mm -hmm. And everybody was saying the court's never going to do that. That's too much. And you just have to have this hope. I have a hope that we're gonna reduce the prison population in this country by half. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to hope we can do it in the next decade. So for me, it's a way of life. It is an orientation, it's a philosophy. And I see remarkable hopefulness, even in some of the most difficult situations. My name is Danielle Bainbridge, and I'm the host, writer, and creator of the PBS Origin of Everything channel on YouTube, where we talk about our underrepresented, undertold, and underknown histories in order to engage with our collective story. You speak about the ideals of justice in your book, which is very separate sometimes from the ideals of incarceration. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit about what the role of incarceration actually is or what its function is as you see it and how it interacts with the ideals of justice that you discuss. Yeah, I don't think that incarceration is an end in and of itself. I don't mm -hmm. think there's something inherently purposeful or valuable about putting people in jails and prisons. I do think that we have to engage in an intervention when people are in crisis, when they're a threat to other people or when they're a threat to themselves. But we ought to be thinking about rehabilitation. We ought to be thinking about restoration. Mm -hmm. I think any just society ought to want people who commit crimes, who fall down, to find a way to get back up, to re-engage and be healthy and contribute to the society that they at one point menaced. And that's ultimately the goal, mm -hmm. is to create safe and healthy communities. Yeah. Throughout Just Mercy, there are so many lows and there are so many setbacks. And there's a, there's a story that you mention in the book where you talk about uh, having a conversation with Rosa Parks. Could you tell us that story and, sure. and maybe share as well how you keep pushing through that? Yeah. Well, when I moved to Montgomery, I, I uh, got a call from an extraordinary woman by the name of Johnny Carr, who was the architect of the Montgomery bus boycott. And uh, Ms. Carr called me up and she said, Brian, I understand you're a young lawyer, just moved to town. I'm 81 years old. And she said, I am fierce. When I call you up and ask you to do something, you're gonna say, yes, ma'am. So I said, yes, ma'am. And she would send me places to speak and send me places to listen. And uh, one day she called me up and said, Rosa Parks is coming to town and we're gonna get together and talk. Do you wanna come over and listen? And I said, oh, yes, ma'am. And I went over and I listened to Rosa Parks and Johnny Carr talk for almost two hours. And the amazing thing was these women weren't talking about the things they had done. They were still talking about the things they intended to do. And Ms. Parks looked at me and she said, Brian, tell me about the Equal Justice Initiative. Tell me what you're trying to do. 
And I looked at Ms. Carter to see if I had permission to speak, and she nodded. And I turned to Ms. Parkinson, I gave her my whole rap. I said, we're trying to do something to end the death penalty. We're trying to help people who are mentally ill. We're trying to challenge the plight of children in our courts. We're trying to help people who are poor. We're trying to do something about systemic racism. I gave her my whole rap. And when I finished, she looked at me and she said, mm, mm, mm. She said, that's gonna make you tired, tired, tired. <laughs> And that's when Ms. Carr leaned forward and she put her finger in my face and she said, that's why you've got to be brave, brave, brave. And I do think it takes courage to be hopeful, but it's also energizing. You know, when you wake up and, and you think that your life matters and that maybe you can make a difference for people in the world, that's a really precious, really precious feeling. My name is John Fish, and I run an eponymous YouTube channel called John Fish. I love to read because I grew up in a house that was constantly full of books. Where I explore ideas and challenges as I enter life as a young adult. I just want to say, you know, I admire you a ton. I was hoping that we could look at the last line of the book and then maybe share, you know, why you chose to end the book on that note. Yeah. So I have it here for okay, you. Okay, terrific. There were lots of people who came up to me who needed legal help for all sorts of things. I hadn't brought business cards, so I wrote my number down for each person and encouraged them to call my office. It wasn't likely that we could do much for many of the people who needed help, but it made the journey home less sad to hope that maybe we could. Yeah, that last line I wrote um, as an epilogue, I just, wanted to end the book with an awareness that um, even though we resolve some of the cases that I described, we're still in the middle of a struggle. We're still in the middle of a crisis where there are thousands of people who are wrongly convicted. And I wanted to make sure that the readers understood that there's still work to be done. I think what we have to remind people is that justice only comes, change only comes, progress only comes when we're willing to do uncomfortable things. And the hard thing is that because we're human, we're biologically and psychologically programmed to do what's comfortable. And too many people positioned in power in our criminal justice system aren't proximate to poor and excluded and neglected people or abused people. We all have to be mindful of the way in which we are privileged and not let our privilege and our power block us from seeing things that we need to see, hearing things, that we need to hear. And that's the great opportunity that we can create for ourselves when we get proximate to people who are different. That's what opens your eyes and your mind and your heart to doing justice. And I just want to encourage people to do that and never doubt your power, your ability to make a difference because each light can be just the illumination we need to see something we haven't seen before. I think that's the perfect place to end, sure. Brian. I'd yeah. like to thank you so much for being here with us today, for sharing your incredible story, for sharing the stories in the book and in the film, which we all got to screen. Yeah. And I'd also like to say that BookTube is just the perfect place for this kind of conversation. Oh, thank you. About literature and about the impact that a story and the way that we tell stories can create impactful change. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for creating a space for a conversation like this. I, I really appreciate it. I'm going to try to do this. I've never done it before. So it's like up, down, up, down. down. I'm so sorry. <laughs>